And I remember we had a particularly bad summer where there were three or four significant fatal accidents. And it sort of made you, it made you realise that this was the real business we were involved with. This was a dangerous pursuit. This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app so you don't miss out on any of the episodes. Paul continues his story with his recruitment into the Army Air Corps. It's initially delayed with the tour providing airfield repair in West Germany and then the Falklands, but finally he's at training at Middle Wallop, the home of the Army Air Corps. He describes the training, including underwater escapes, flying and navigation. He graduates as a gazelle crewman whose role was navigator, observer and co-pilot. We hear of exercises including the lesser-known Raylex Probex, a US, French and British exercise to reopen a land corridor to West Berlin should the links be closed by Warsaw Pact forces, as well as his activities with the British Frontier Service. Paul's story is again full of great anecdotes, as well as the dangerous reality of flying low-level missions in a single-engined aircraft, including a forced landing with a general aboard. Don't miss our previous episode where Paul joins the army as a boy soldier in the Royal Engineers. Now, Cold War history is disappearing, but a simple monthly donation will help keep this podcast on the air. You'll get the sought after Cold War Conversations drinks coaster as a thank you and bask in the warm glow of knowing that you're helping to preserve Cold War history. This is Mary O'Grady of Albuquerque, New Mexico. Anyone who's interested in Cold War history should definitely subscribe and support Cold War Conversations. Thank you. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. If a financial contribution is not your cup of tea, then you can still help us by leaving written reviews wherever you listen to us as well as sharing us on social media. It really helps us get new guests on the show. I'm delighted to welcome Paul to our Cold War conversation. I had an interview with somebody from the Army Air Corps. Um, And then I think about a month later, I was loaded on an aircrew selection, which in those days uh, was carried out on behalf of the Army Air Corps by the RAF. So I can't remember which RAF base I went to, but I know I had to take a suit. I only had one suit, you know, a suit and tie, civilian clothes. And that's because the most of the uh, selection was RAF uh, candidates, which were graduates or in some case undergraduates who were looking to have a career in the RAF as a pilot. And, you know, amongst there were eight soldiers. So it stuck out like a sore thumb in all sorts of ways, um, certainly older um, and uh, certainly already at the bar in this place. And it was all part of the test, I think, really. But they, they, they put you through a battery of tests. So as you can imagine, very stringent medical, quite a lot of aptitude testing, hand to eye coordination, all of the sort of traditional air crew selection stuff, psychometric testing, which was interesting because obviously, you know, even I'd only been serving for in, I'd only been in uniform sort of four and a half years, but you're already conditioned by then. So questions like, would you feel nervous with a loaded gun in your hand? Probably elicit a slightly different response from the eight soldiers than perhaps the other students who were in the room. The nub of it was, even despite the brain scan, <laughs> I, uh, I was, uh, I was offered a place in this, the, 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 the army air corps, uh, officer who was there at the uh, in the RAF selection centre said, so "Look, you're you're only a lance corporal and you're quite young, so the offer is go away and come back in a year or two years' time and try again for pilot, or come in now as an air crewman." So never been one to hang around. I said, "Oh, I'd I'd love to come in as as an air crewman." You know, what what does one of them do? Uh, and they said, "Well, you know, you 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 get to fly the helicopter." Uh, but your main job is to do the observation and the navigation and the radios and support the pilot who's the, the, the pilot of the aircraft and the commander. But obviously, you will be taught to fly the aircraft. You will have controls. Mm. So, oh, well, that sounds that sounds excellent. You know, um, I was also quite taken with the light blue berry, I'll be honest with you. you know? So I, they said, well, wait out. You know, we'll, we'll, you'll hear from us. 
So I went back to uh, went back to Osnabrück, and everyone, you know, as you can imagine, when the the word got out, the the ribbing started. You know, I've seen you drive a Land Rover. I don't want to be in the helicopter with you and all that sort of stuff. And then very quickly, I was posted, and I was posted back to the UK, much to my horror. Um, actually, I wasn't. I would like to have stayed in Germany, but I was posted back to uh, to Water Beach, which is uh, was closed now, uh, a disused RAF airfield north of Cambridge. Um, and the the task of the squadron, which was five three construction squadron, and in fact the whole regiment was airfield damage repair. So the squadrons were um, allocated an RAF airfield in Germany. Ours was Wildenrath. Um, and our job, our whole raison d'etre, if you like, was to uh, repair, fill and repair a NATO standard crater, which had presumably been produced by a Russian standard bomb. And to do it as quickly as possible and lay a mat, uh, lay a mat over the top, which was essentially trackway, magnesium alloy. And so that the aircraft could take off on the runway or you still use the taxiway. And that's what we practiced against the clock in the dark, in our NBC suits, and it was a, the, the most fantastic choreography of plant. There must be a time lapse video of it around somewhere. There was a particular sequence of events that had to happen with some very large equipment. And it was quite exciting, but it wasn't as exciting as being in, a, you know, laying mines in Germany, to be honest with you. We did deploy to Wildenrath, a big exercise once a year, much to the RAF's horror, I suspect, as we turn up in Wildenrath. And they let us they let us fill in some holes on some disused taxiways. They were going to let us near anything that had a, an aircraft on it. Um, but we did other tasks for them as well while we were there. You know, we'd fix stuff or we'd refurbish a club or something like that. And we were always made very welcome and the food was good. But the, the reality of that, of that, I found out later, was that our, our essentially the strategy at that point from Wildenrath, Larbrook and Bruggen was in that transition to war period. Once we'd, once we'd actually gone hot, they would launch, their, their purpose was to launch all of their aircraft to carry out a strike. So in, in Wildenrath, it was, it was originally phantoms and then tornadoes. Um, and while they were away, the expectation is the airfield would be bombed um, conventionally, I would think. Uh, and there would be some holes created, which we would have to go and repair sufficient, as I understand it, that we, they could then recover the survivors from that first strike, refuel them, rearm them and send them off again. At which point everyone would head west because they just essentially knew that if there was any survivors from that, they'd have to go back to the UK. And how realistic that was, I don't know. But that was all. I didn't know that at the time. I must be honest. I didn't know that at the time. But I don't know where I read about that. But it, it sort of makes sense in a way. The timings may not work. But so that was our job was repair the runway once and then head west. How fast I was going to go in a digger, I'm not too sure, but that was that was the that was the plan. <laughs> you mentioned NBC there. I mean, were you doing many practices in NBC kit all the time? So whenever we went on active edge, certainly on the big exercises, Crusader eighty and, and the and Red Claymore, essentially lived in your NBC suit. To be honest, it, it was just just an expectation as that you you know you would wear it. Perhaps not from the get go, but you once you'd got it on, you'd you'd only be taking it off to put a new one on. That's my that's my recollection. Um I mean I think on Red Claymore it was so wet I had a tank suit over the top of my NBC suit, which isn't quite the idea, but you know, it was so yeah, we wore it all the time and, and for the and the airfield damage repair, that was just a standard dress. Um I know some people wore jeans and a t shirt underneath their NBC suit in the hope that they'd make the pub in the village before it closed after the build had finished so we we wore mbc all the time and we very often did the runway repair in red so in in respirators and gloves etc um, which is just an added difficulty factor if you're driving a big digger <laughs> i mean to be wearing that for days at a time because this quite wasn't grotty. breathable gore-tex or something like that was it it was like no. being wrapped in a bin bag a little bit. It's got charcoal lining, so the bits that okay. touch the skin, you'd, they'd go. They, you know, you'd get black cuffs around your arms, and you know, which is why we needed the mobile bath unit in on Crusader eighty. Because you've been wearing that stuff for two weeks, then um, I mean, it starts to fall to bits. And if you don't get another suit, you start looking like Popsky's Private Army as well. I mean, we very quickly binned the overboots unless they really made us wear them because um, they just did not work. Uh, some people would wear them to keep their boots dry, but all I remember really is, is that, you know, in, in the winter, it was a bonus because 
if it was if it's in the winter or it was raining it was another layer um mm. and if it was the summer it was just horrible the, you know the strategy was to make you wear it a lot so you got used to wearing it and that did work because it, i'd never questioned it i always you know i always accepted why i think most people accepted why it was necessary to wear it i think we all had views of our chances of survival or what percentage of us would survive a a nerve agent strike um but again it was one of those things we didn't labor it we didn't labor the point you know what was the point in talking about it so so yeah but it was yeah it was it was absolutely the you know just the norm to wear it it wasn't unusual it was the norm um which i think was quite deliberate how does the air crew selection go because i think you you it's delayed somewhat it I is believe. yeah so um i i was invited i was a i was a class two fitter out of Chepstow. Um, and the next logical step is class one. The, the squadron in Waterbeach was warned off that it was going to go to the Falklands. Um, this, the war had finished at this point in 82, but there was a plan to surge. So it sent a lot of engineer squadrons in 83 to essentially rebuild that had been, that had been destroyed, uh, attempt to recover uh, some of the areas that had been sown with mines. And, and more importantly, build a couple of radar stations on, on some mountain tops um, to defend the Falklands better in terms of early warning of any um, follow-on attack. Because of course, you know, the peace was war was never declared, but now there was peace declared, so it's still an operational theatre at this point. Um, so we were warned off that we were going to go to the Falklands as part of this um, this surge in '83, um, and the squadron, and in fact the corps were very short of petroleum fitters. The one thing that they knew they would need in the, in the Falklands was petroleum fitters because RAF Stanley, which we were using at the time, which was long before Mount Pleasant Airfield was, was um, openly being discussed or considered, would need to be provided with aviation fuel in a more sustained fashion than it, than it was at the time. My job was to maintain the temporary pipework network and tanks that took fuel from a, a ship, a tanker offshore, um, and then provided that to the RAF, to Harriers at that stage. There were some Phantoms there as well and helicopter replens so of a lot of helicopter reliance. Um, and it was while I was there that my call forward came from the Army Air Corps to, to join the um, uh, Air Crewman's course. Not surprisingly, the squadron said he's not available. He's deployed on an operational tour, you know, come back later. So and it was just it was a passing blip. You know, I, I was disappointed but i was realistic that there were only two petroleum fitters on on the island i think at this point uh, and i was one of them so it was unlikely they were going to let me go stayed on a little bit longer because they were the next squadron was short of petroleum fitters i think they hadn't finished their course so we actually stayed on a little bit longer um and it eventually came back to um came back to the uk and it took a while actually it took a while because i remember i deployed to wildenrath again not as the main exercise but as a thing called the essential services team exercise where we would go and practice joining um destroyed pipelines and electrical cables so very much more on the sort of more technical side just a small group of us so i think it probably took about seven or eight months after we got back before my call forward came to go to um to middle wallet so um turned up at middle wallop to a course of i think there was about 10 of us a couple of army air corps ground crew who had been selected for air crew uh, a couple of raw marine raw marine commandos who had again been selected for air crew who were going to uh, end up in three commando air squadron it was as it was called at the time and then a real cross section of the rest of the army so uh, a couple of gunners um, at least one tanky as i remember so it was an interesting, interesting, uh, interesting first couple of days because, of course, you're still wearing your normal regimental regalia because, you you know, you're still a sapper. Uh, and there are loads of people wandering around Middle Wallet, which was a fantastic place. It's an airfield in Wiltshire near Salisbury. All sorts of different uniforms and jumpers. In those days, it was the days of the woolly pulley, you know, the, the army jumper. And there were people wearing blue jumpers and there were people wearing grey jumpers and there were all sorts of colours of berry going on, like quite apart from the Army Air Corps Blue. So it was really quite entertaining. And the training was fantastic. We did a bit of ground school um, just to make sure everybody was at the same standard. But very quickly, we moved on to, to navigation, which is sort of high level, you know, map and, map and compass stopwatch sort of stuff. And then once you'd cut your teeth on that, um, you then descended lower and lower to, to becoming essentially map reading. So the transition from navigation, which is, you know, proper airmanship 
to what the army really needed you to do was low level navigation of the aircraft. And that was our primary, primary function, along with vehicle recognition. So it, obviously, if you're, if, you're, if, you're in the, if you're on the recce, the front end of the recce, it's quite important that you can tell the difference between a Chieftain and a T-62 or a T-55. And so vehicle recognition was pushed quite hard. And you can actually fail the course if you didn't meet, quite understandably, if you didn't meet the required standard of vehicle recognition, you, you, could, you could fail the course. And we had a Royal Military Policeman on the course. Um, and of course, it never really had the need i don't think to do any of this stuff and he found that quite hard and he ended up on review you used to get an extra seven hours uh if you you know if you if you sort of reach rock bottom they'd get you in and say right you're on review you've got seven hours pull your socks up otherwise you're gone and uh the poor lad nearly failed the course because he couldn't recognize the difference between a pmp and a B, bd bmd um but he got there in the end with a bit of you know it was, it was a good working together type environment a lot of teamwork I remember being absolutely terrified at the concept of the Dunker, which is the underwater escape trainer, which we had to go to the south coast, HMS Daedalus. Um, and I confided in one of the Royal Marines that I was not a good swimmer at all. And I had got myself to a, such a point I couldn't, I've put, couldn't put my face in the shower, the thought of being strapped into this module. And he said, stick with, with me and the other guy. Stick with me tomorrow and we'll see you right. We've done it loads of times because they deployed to the Arctic and every time they went they had to do helicopter escape training um, and they looked after me they basically got me out the first time which then gave me a bit of confidence and uh, you know I survived in the end can you describe what what that escape training is and what what that what it's supposed to simulate sure yeah so in those days um, HMS Daedalus had a large what I'd only describe as a water tower it looked like a water tower anyway the big water tower and uh, what it is, what it actually had was the the uh, underwater escape trainer for the helicopter on the very top, and the rest of the tower was for submarine escape training. So there would be there'd be an, 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 I don't quite know how it worked, but there was an airlock system at the bottom where you could start your ascent, and there would be Royal Navy clearance divers at various points to make sure that your sub narrow were breathing out. They had a rebreather, which meant that you had to breathe out for your entire ascent because otherwise your, your lungs would explode, as I understand it. So that was the main function of the tower. And then on the top of it, in this large pond, was a Lynx module. So essentially two pilot seats and then a bench seat in the back, um, which I think took three on each side. Uh, as I remember, it was in the fore and aft configuration. So three seats behind the pilot and then three seats side on so and essentially the idea was you'd climb in first of all in any non-swimmers so if you're a non-swimmer you've got a red helmet so you're wearing life you're wearing life jackets and they would strap you in to these various seats in the aircraft uh, there's clearance clearance divers around safety divers around but what was worse before you even started they showed you a video of various links either full size or models being dropped into a tank with their flotation gear on them, all of which very rapidly turned turtle and sank. So it wasn't the greatest start in terms of confidence to this thing, because they were basically just showing you a drop into a helicopter in the water, which immediately sank. And you thought, mm, OK, so there were instructions. You'll go into the water. The module will then turn upside down. Once it comes to a complete stop, count to 20 so that the blades have fallen off and then release yourself and exit the aircraft through the closest window. So you had to keep one hand on your quick release harness of your of quick release buckle of your harness. And the other hand, if you were able to on the on an external point of the aircraft, if you're on the middle seat, you basically hung on to the person next to you, hung on to a strap or something. You know, it's it focuses the mind Ian. it focuses the mind when this wall of water comes up, no matter how much you think you're going to be prepared and you're going to take a breath. One, it's cold. Secondly, it's quite quick. And it's quite, it's disconcerting, you know, it, it's, um, so eventually this thing stops upside down. And then the more experienced, i.e. these two Royal Marines, one of which was either side of me, bless their hearts, dragged me out of the side window of this Lynx and you pop to the surface and there they, they count you off. And there's a diver inside the module to help anybody that gets into difficulties. And then you do that a couple of times in different seating positions and then they culminate in one in the dark, <laughs> which wasn't a lot of fun. They turn the lights out and it is dark. So then you really are relying upon, you know, which way is up. And they regularly have people swimming in the wrong direction. 
or, or getting stuck in the aircraft didn't happen on our course. It happened on the on the course before us. Um, we watched some people getting dragged out by the clearance diver. But the the two Royal Marines decided I was in, I was okay by this point. So the two Royal Marines decided they'd have a bit of fun um, because they'd done this loads of time before. Why not? So they they decided they would go into the air pocket in the back of the module and say hello to the clearance diver. <laughs> The clearance diver didn't take too kindly to this. So they both came out rubbing their cheeks where he, I think he'd either give them, a, give them a bit of a cuff for, for, for not taking things seriously. Uh, and the relationship between, between the Royal Navy and the Royal Marines is interesting at, at best. So, um, so yeah, so that, that's, that's, we survived that. Um, and somehow, somehow I survived the course because at the end of the course, dangled like a carrot is what they call pure flying. So that's actually you getting hold of the controls of this thing. So you do weeks and weeks and weeks of navigation, map reading, getting tougher and tougher. We didn't have the sight on the roof of this day, so it's just stabilized binoculars. And then they keep they they dangle this carrot at the end of pure flying. And you're everybody's so looking forward to actually getting to fly this helicopter. And it's awfully disappointing when you discover you're no good at it. And that was me. So we had a we had a gunner who was like a space cadet. He just took to this thing like a duck to water, and he was already doing hovers and all sorts of stuff. The rest of us were being taught to essentially take control of the aircraft because the pilot's been incapacitated, as they used to say. Uh, take control of the aircraft, find out what the wind direction is, select a suitable field, and then run the aircraft on. So, like a lot of Army Air Corps aircraft in those days, had skids. And so the safest way was to, rather than try and do hovering or anything like that, was to do a long, slow approach into wind, and run this thing onto its skids, and then basically abandon the aircraft and take the pilot with you. And it took quite a lot of effort on the part of a number of instructors to get me to land that helicopter. Uh, I remember making a, a very fast landing on Everly DZ on a drop zone on Salisbury Plain. And I knew it was fast because you could hear the grass rushing through the skids. So I thought to myself, I'm going a bit quick here. So quick, in fact, that the gazelle slid up the hill and over the top and we were airborne again, except I, who was supposed to be in charge of the aircraft, I thought we were still on the ground. Uh, and the pilot announced in no uncertain terms that we were airborne again and he was taking control of the aircraft. And he said to me, you're so heavy handed, you're like a bulldozer driver. <laughs> and I said, yeah. Go figure. I made it and uh, I was posted back to Germany, uh, which I was very happy about. I was posted to Minden, which is um, on the Weser between between Osnabrück and Hanover, really. Uh, and I was posted to an independent squadron, 664 Squadron Army Air Corps. And the squadron had a dual role, um, had purely gazelle. So I think it had 12 gazelles. Six were allocated to Headquarters uh, 1BR call as liaison, so that that means moving senior officers around the the, the countryside, the bleak battlefield, and the other six aircraft were allocated to the core recce screen. So along with the core recce regiments, so I think in those days 912 Lancers, CBRT scimitars and Scorpions, uh, mainly scimitars, and that was the sort of forward edge of the forward edge of the battle areas. It was known in those days they would operate in the forward edge of the battle area either advance to contact or dug in to um, dug into prepared positions and observing the enemy and the and the, the gazelles would do the same by this stage we had the roof site 10 times 10 magnification which was on the crewman side of the aircraft so that was my main job navigate us to some uh, some location behind some trees or behind some hedgerows or whatever and then hover the aircraft and, and observe uh, and then make contact reports as the as the hordes poured across the battlefield. That that was the job of recce, recce. So initially, you spent your time in liaison in the headquarters flight, and then you sort of made the grade once the pilots and the senior flying instructors sort of knew that you were you could do the map reading. You'd then transition into the you know the sort of cutting edge of the squadron. So um, when I first went there, they were in an old World War Two German uh, Luftwaffe hangar that had had Fiesler Storch German recce aircraft in it which I always found was a, quite a nice irony in the fact, a little grass strip. But um, shortly after I arrived, they started building us a new hangar, which was very palatial, very palatial indeed. Uh, you know, and sadly, we weren't in there many years before uh, the whole of Minden closed down as part of options. Um, and the Army Air Corps pretty, pretty rapidly moved back into their main locations and then back to the UK. So, you know, we left that, we left that hangar almost as good as new. 
Uh, it was an interesting place. In fact, on one of the reforger exercises, I think, the Apache uh, helicopter gunship was in American service, but had never been seen in Europe. Uh, they were only had only just come into service. And on this reforger exercise, our OC was it was it was called and it was requested that uh, this unit of Apache could hide in our hangar during the day. Uh, it turned out later they were being used as the like Corps commander's counter strike, which was the final act of the exercise. So we had to clear all of the gazelle and the benches. There was, you know, quite a lot of space in this hangar. Cleared it all out. Put the put the gazelles out on the on the pan, if you like, on the concrete out, outside. And then one at a time, these Apache turned up. Bear in mind that we'd only ever seen an Apache, you know, on, in pictures really. And I remember they now they all came in with the they had gold they had gold lined um, glass to cut down glare. And these aircraft came in, and you know they're, they're an impressive machine. But when you see them for the first time. Um, on wheels as well, so they could actually roll up to the to the front of the hangar and close down, and then very easy, it just attached a clip to the rear wheel and pulled it in our aircraft. Getting our aircraft on wheels was a song and dance. It really was. Moving them around on skids was difficult, and we packed these. I'm sure it was at least ten Apache into the hangar. There was a bit of blade folding going on, but the Americans dealt with it very efficiently joined us in the crew room, regaled us with loads of tails. They left a couple outside and some people got a ride. Sadly, I didn't get a ride. The pilots, uh, the, you know, the officers and the senior NCO pilots in the squadron got first dibs. And then sort of last light, they rolled them out um, and flew off into the night, which was very impressive as you see these 10 aircraft fly away into the distance. Mm. Um, so that, that was quite memorable. Did they play Ride of the Valkyries as they uh, No, but in? we were all humming it, you know. We were definitely all humming it. Yeah, it was it was quite something. It was quite it was one of those memorable moments. It really was. So, yeah, so that that was me. I was so I spent quite a lot of time in headquarters flight, as I said, flying senior officers around uh, around Germany, including the corps commander, um, who um, in most of my most of my time um, I was like VIP cleared. So we were allowed to fly VIP. So if we had visiting politicians or US senators or generals or stuff then we would get to fly those which which was great because it's quite a small aircraft so um you you know you're, you're it's quite intimate as well you've got one live intercom you can't switch the front from the back so you have to sort of rub along together which is you know which is quite nice but you hear stuff obviously that as a corporal as a full corporal by then um you hear stuff that you're not supposed to hear but you're also treated quite you're treated very well because you know your your air crew. So I remember it very fondly, and we had a habit of on the back of our bone domes of our of our crash helmets, we had our name and our regiment on the old fashioned dynatape, you know the clicky dynatape. Oh yeah. And other people name you know Sergeant Smith, Third RRF, Third Regiment of Fusiliers, and we for a while had a Sergeant Major who was our helicopter instructor from the Royal Marines. And uh, on the back of his helmet, he's, uh, his dimer tape said, it's Sergeant Major, not Sir, you Pongo bastard. And so that was for all to read. So the Corps Commander said, um, Sergeant Major, what's that on the back of your helmet? And then he turned around, realised he's looking at a Royal Marine and just chuckled because you know he was a big man as well. He wasn't not to be argued yeah. with. Um, so that So, yeah, it was very cool. So we were, we were lucky in that squadron because we were cleared – the only squadron that were cleared to fly the inner German border. So all other aviation assets in uh, Germany, be it helicopter or fixed wing, had to stay outside the, the ADIS, which was the air defence interdiction zone. So basically it was a five kilometre, as I remember it, buffer between the inner German border uh, and, and into West Germany. And basically anything crossed that line um, without clearance would be intercepted by in our part of Germany, RAF aircraft, so probably tornadoes or phantoms uh, in the early days, possibly a Harrier if they were quick enough, um, or if further south, you know, American assets would go and intercept what was ever was in that um, ADIS. And we were allowed to go inside that, um, inside that zone as long as we had a member of the British Frontier Service on board. So the traditional trip was to go to Helmstedt and land in the smallest car park you've ever seen. So our pilots used to have to do this confined space landing. It always made me nervous. Um, and then a chap who would come out, old, older sort of chap, you know, older chap dressed in what looked like Royal Navy uniform. That's what the British Frontier Service 
and he would climb aboard. He was a Brit, but he was an expert on the inner German border in that in that zone. And as I remember, we invariably flew south from there through the edge of a very large open cast coal mine, which was on the East German side. Uh, and then we would fly down and into the Harz Mountains. Um, and the idea was really just to just to fly and be seen flying the border, you know, taking our rights. And we would regularly, at least once a trip, land at one of the observation positions. So we'd land in a field and then we'd walk up to these, like a landing stage built up so that you could look out into, into East Germany. Generally something interesting like one of those um, big uh, lookout towers. And I remember his instructions were, those of us that had, um, I had, I had an SMG, a, a submachine gun, pilots invariably had a pistol. But you say, like, put your, wear your weapon slung down the centre of your back so that they can't photograph it. Why they'd be interested in a Sterling 9mm submachine gun, I do not know. It was just one step up from a Sten gun. Um, and keep your hands in your pockets, which was very rare. You know, very rare. Mostly people would be telling you to take your hands out of your pockets. But the British Frontier said, no, keep your hands in your pockets. He said, and don't respond to any waves or shouts or anything. He said, because if you if you put your hand up as in a wave, the chances are they'll choose to doctor the picture so it looks like a fist and they'll make some sort of. So that's quite alarming. And he said, and we'll time it once we've landed. He said, I'll put the stopwatch on and we'll see how how quick it is before the Vopos or the German border guards turn up. Um, and they'd be there pretty quickly. Whenever there was an air, an aircraft land, that would always get their interest. So they would turn up in the splinter camouflage in one of those gas jeeps or, or one of the Trabant jeeps. Invariably, one of them had a big telephoto lens and he would spend his whole time taking pictures of us. Of course, the Army Air Corps Blue Beret is very distinctive, which we would be wearing. And so it would be loads of pictures taken. And the British Frontier Service guy would just point out various interesting points allegedly a lot of the mines had been removed certainly the certainly the anti the, the automatic firing devices um i remember that much but whether or not the mines were still there was difficult to say but there was certainly still the death strip um of, of you know sort of a beaten zone which was clear of any vegetation did you ever come across uh, another helicopter flying the other side of the border while you were there sadly no no, but I had colleagues in the squadron that had an interesting... Well, it, it happened on an occasion, but they had a particularly interesting encounter with a Hind D, um, you know, which is a big, chunky gunship. Um, it's a big mm. aircraft. And they flew in formation um, for a while with them while both sides took pictures um, uh, on each side of the border. Um, and so, yeah, I was very sorry that never happened to me. But no, never came anywhere near it, really, to be honest. Wow. No. Wow. And the, the British Frontier Service is a fascinating, forgotten unit of the Cold War. I mean, these guys in, as you say, in what looks like British naval uniform, who were experts on their particular area of the, um, you know, the inner German border. And uh, sadly, I don't think there's any of them around. No. And there's a book. There's a book in there, isn't there? There's a book in there. There is. You know, you know what's the origin? How did, how come they ended up? And it, it must be, it must have sprung from 1945. But I never took the time or the effort to to find out. And of course now it's it's quite difficult, isn't it? You know, I I yeah. um, I've not seen anything about about them really. So um, sounds like a trip to the National Archives is required to uh, have a look at that. <laughs> Big um, book that. I'd yeah, buy it. it would be a good book. Yeah, it would. It would. And, and and they they were also involved in another fascinating exercise that our squadron used to support because it was inside that that ADIS, which was a exercise Railex Probex, which was a US, French, and British combined uh, exercise. Essentially, the premise was was that the Soviets had closed the land corridor and train corridor to to Berlin, presumably the air corridor as well. Uh, and that, that the Allied forces were going to exercise their right to basically bust back through to Berlin. Now, how realistic a prospect that, that was, I'm not sure, because Magdeburg's in the way, and there was a, quite a lot of nine guard shock army based in Magdeburg. But um, the idea was in that really close to the border. So the exercise for us was based in Wolfenbüttel, which was one of the core recce screens. Again, it was it was nine twelve lances in those days, and they, were, I think, must have been the furthest forward British unit. Must have been the furthest forward British unit. Very well prepared barracks. Even had an, an underheated um, helicopter 
landing pad. It was the only one I know of in Germany. So wow. they were they were clearly intent on business. And we were based in Wolfenbüttel. And then we would fly in support of this, essentially, which was quite a big PR exercise of various units from the, the three armies, either separately or together, driving around on the roads quite close to the border so that they could be seen and then carrying out various tasks or simulated exercise. There was quite a big um, enemy forces unit um, involved in being the opposition for that. And that included the US Army's Red Star Company, which was a, a basically a load of Americans wearing Russian uniforms using captured Russian equipment, which the Americans had quite a lot of. So I can remember B BRDM ones and twos, uh, a T-62, a T-55, you know, a Russian tank transporter, all all decked out with red stars on, and that was, so that was quite impressive actually having them or having them on the exercise. I've seen them on some British Army training films. These units, because I I remember seeing, I think, oh, this 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 is you know not you know British kit try, attempted to be mocked up. This is this is the real stuff. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, with the the American troops running them you know manning them were they sort of like um in role as well not really not really there was a few <laughs> there was a few words of russian being thrown around for effect yeah um but um you know they they were i think the biggest task was keeping most of this stuff on the road to be honest you know so if you, if you look at opposing forces that the americans created in the in the mainland us they they never attempted to to use captured equipment, even though there was quite a lot of it around. They would dress mm. up older they would dress up older equipment um, to look like uh, to look like Soviet tanks. So they use like the Sheridan to look like a T seventy two because the wheel configuration is very similar. Um, so and it was a big task, I think, keeping this stuff on the road. So it was used more for effect than than anything else. Um, yeah. And I think it was a bit of a snub as well to say, look, you know, we've got some of your kit. <laughs> which they captured at various hotspots around the, around the world, I guess. What was interesting is each of the allied units, each of the vehicles, every single vehicle had a little flag stand and a, a US, French and British um, flag on the, on the top to denote that it was Railex Probex and it was a, you know, the, the three occupying powers, which was a bit of a throwback because, you know, we, we're partners with the Bundeswehr and the West German army at this stage of the game, but they didn't yeah. play a role in this at all. This was purely yeah. an allied bust back through to Berlin job. I guess they had to be really careful about this Railex Probex exercise as effectively it was an invasion of East Germany. Yeah, it was an interesting premise. Great name for an exercise, though. <laughs> it was a good name. Yeah, it was a good name. Yeah. And yeah, we got warned off. I said, oh, Railex Probex, that sounds interesting. But I guess the Railex was the rail part of the exercise. So a load of raw core transport, rail engineers and an army locomotive and stuff like that were, were messing around on some rail sidings, which got a lot of press coverage. And the Probex bit was the probe that would be sent up the one of the land corridors. So that's where the name came from. Yeah, I mean, it sort of it sort of smacks a bit of Market Garden, but without the yeah. airborne contingent. <laughs> Just a bit. You know, that that sort of, uh, which obviously didn't end no, well. I mean, I get the <laughs> when I, I exactly. I mean, I get the impression looking back on it, you know, with thirty, forty odd years hindsight, that it was largely a PR exercise. There was a lot of invited press coverage. We we spent a lot. Of, I spent a lot of time on my. There were like three aircraft from our squadron deployed. We spent a lot of time mm. doing aerial photography. So sitting sideways, strapped in on an eagle harness with a big old fashioned RAF camera, uh, taking loads and loads of photographs. So you know, I think you know, it, looking back on it, it was I think that was its function. So when we were talking about you flying along the inner German border. Were you told what to do if you accidentally came down on the other side? I mean, the whole purpose, the whole purpose of the British Frontier Service guy on board was to make damn sure that didn't happen. I mean, to be fair, you know, it's it's it, as as borders go, it was pretty well defined. And on the West German side, there were a set of border posts that were set quite a way back. I think for that very reason, because you didn't necessarily want somebody wandering into that area inadvertently. You know, and there were there were areas where it was less defined, and that's really where the, the the BFS guy would be very, very clear about not going beyond a certain 
lying on the ground or you know you know particularly on the edge of the edge of the Harz Mountains obviously much more difficult to mark, mark a border in a wooded area and so we would just err on the side of caution but I can't remember it may have happened but I can't remember a briefing about what happens if we landed the wrong side of the fence um, you know I mean I think the pilots were very clear that if they had a they had any sort of engine issue that um you know all endeavors were going to be made to to fly um to fly west rather than east i did i did i did hear an alarming story about and, and it wasn't it wasn't i don't think it was in our squadron where a, a crew landed at one of these um lookout posts or it may even been dropping the bfs guy off but not at helmstedt maybe the, there was occasion where we dropped him off in a field location and then the instructions were they'd meet another unit on the ground say and we would then pick up and fly directly west to get us out of the aides because without him on board you know that was we were only to allowed to fly in to pick him up and drop him off um and there is a lovely story about the gazelle had a had a a tendency where it took a little bit of time for the main compass to a line because it was on alternating current so the aircraft would would start up and you'd get the blades turning and then you'd have to wait a few minutes while the the compass aligned the the, the ac compass aligned with the standby compass that was the check to make sure both compasses were reading the same and i did hear a story where somebody was in a bit of a rush and they took off slightly prematurely and started much to the british frontier services guys horror started to fly in the wrong direction from this field location um, but very quickly, somebody on the air, in the aircraft thing, hang on a minute, <laughs> you know, surely those mountains should be on our left, you know, something like that. What's called the gross error check, you know, I'm I'm in the hover, I've got a motorway to my left, and I've got some mountains to my right. Is that does that sound about right? Yes. So they very quickly did a quick U-turn and flew back in the other direction. But it could it probably is an army air corps urban legend. There's plenty of them out there. 664 Squadron was an interesting squadron because um, Army Air Corps dress regulations would suggest that uh, if you were uh, an, on extra regimental employment, like most of us were from other regiments and corps, that you would only wear uh, one item from your original regiment. So in the main Army Air Corps regiments in Hilda Simon, Detmold, and in those days in Zost in three divs area, um, a, a Royal Engineer like me would wear a Royal Engineer cap badge in an Army Air Corps beret with an Army Air Corps stable belt in the same way that the Royal Electrical Mechanical Engineers attached to, say, the, the Royal Green Jackets would wear all Royal Green Jackets kit and a Remy cap badge. Um, both of the, the both of the OCs of the squadron while I was there, one of them was one of them was a gunner and one was the arm, an Army Air Corps guy. They 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 operated their independent squadron in a way that you were encouraged to wear all of your regimental regalia. So with the exception of flying boots, which were like the thing to have. So soft top boots, uh, which you wore, with your bows were allowed to hang down in your boots. I don't know why it was typical army, you know, so uh, which I loved, I absolutely loved. And your army air corps, your blue army air corps beret. In those early days, when we went on exercise, we wore a dark blue beret, so the same as very dark blue, almost black beret that I would have worn in the sappers, but with a with a light blue backing behind the cap badge to indicate there was Army Air Corps. As soon as the Kevlar combat helmet came into being, the wearing of black berets on exercise became a thing of the past for the Army Air Corps. So you either wore your Army Air Corps beret, your aircraft bone dome, or your combat helmet. So... But yes, yeah, so so as a result in 664 Squadron, within the I think I counted once, within the air crew, there were like 16 or 17 different regiments and corps represented, each of them wearing their own kit with about as much artistic license as was permitted. And quite a lot of it was permitted. So you know, on a good day, it looked like Popsky's private army. So, it, you know, you have somebody from the Scots Greys with a grey jumper. You'd have somebody from the Royal Artillery with a blue jumper on. You know, it looked like it had been knitted by their mum. Officers, was, officers were particularly uh, prone to this this habit. Um, and we, we won the Rolls-Royce Trophy, I think, which was, I think, was given to the best serviceability, aided by the fact that we didn't have any links, I think, was a great part of it. Because, you know, links took a lot of, a lot of maintenance. Um, and we had to have a parade. And my my colleague was a lancer from 912 Lancers, and he, he he was essentially a marching Christmas tree. 
So he, he had uh, silver Prince of Wales feathers on the sleeve, a brass Rolls Royce armoured car on the, on the bottom of his uh, number two dress, a white belt, unlike everybody else, white gloves, an officer's shirt and tie, and a flat cloth cap badge. And he insisted on wearing his berry in what was called a tanky two-way stretch. So his berry was so that you could wear headphones over the, uh, the berry. So it was very popular back in the 60s and the 70s. And being a traditional cavalry regiment, this was encouraged. And also what can only be described as a rhubarb and custard lanyard. So sort of yellow and yellow and red, yellow and crimson, ornate lanyard. Um, so, yeah. Wow. Pretty impressive. I hope you've got photos of him. I have. I have. He was also when he was in the nine twelve Lancers, he was the he was the soldier in his squadron that was permitted to grow the cavalry moustache. So essentially big sideboards and a big curly moustache. I think with a slot shaved in the sideboards to make them legal. There's nothing anything and he was in the oh, habit yeah. of waxing this moustache Prussian style. You know, all for effect. Um so we we had to parade in our number two dress for the Sergeant Major ahead of this Rolls-Royce um, trophy parade. And he took one look at my uh, my friend, Lance Corporal, um, and said, there's no way you can go on parade like that. He says, he, he said, what's that? You know, oh, it's an old Snarma car, sir. And, what, and he, he said, I couldn't go on the parade anyway, sir, because I can't do SLR drill, because we had SLRs in those days, although most of us had mm-hmm. SMGs around as well. But we had for this parade, it was SLRs. <laughs> Being a being a cavalry soldier, he'd never he'd never handled an SLR in his life, so that was it. He was banned from the parade square and ended up opening the car door for the general when he arrived. That was his that was his job that he got. <laughs> um, so the the other thing I remember from my, from six six four, it was I nearly had a career limiting moment. Well, I did have a career limiting moment, but fortunately, thanks to a very um, very kind pilot, I got away with it. So I was on one of the, I was in in the recce. Um, flight by this point so and i remember, can't remember what exercise it was but we were right far forward with a, a, a british um it was nine four locating regiment so they were the sound rangers and uh, uh, the radar people so they they were ahead of the forward edge of the battle area and we were we'd landed to have i think we were with one of the army uh, one of the royal artillery um senior officers and we'd landed to have a chat with this group from nine four locating and um we were just drinking a cup of tea, just, you know, chewing the cud. And I got my SMG with me in the in the woods and this sort of forward area of the woods. And all of a sudden in the distance, someone spotted all of these German, West German tanks coming over the hill, which was essentially German reserve forces were playing the, the enemy. And they were mm-hmm. bearing down on us pretty rapidly. So there was a huge panic and crash out. We ran to our helicopter, got everybody on board. And we flew the um, artillery officers back, not that far, to another field location, dropped them off. And then we carried on flying to go back to our location, which I remember was in a German glider strip. We'd, we'd borrowed this German glider strip um, where our echelon with all the tankers was parked up. And I used to have this habit of reaching behind me onto the floor to make sure that my weapon was in the aircraft because it couldn't go in the front. It had to lay in the footwell. So the passengers used to have their feet on my SMG. And I put my f- hand in the back, and it wasn't there. Uh, and I was flying, fortunately, with a with an Army Air Corps sergeant who was nicknamed Mad Dog. Um, he was actually a lovely guy. It's worrying. It's a worrying name, isn't it? But that, isn't that an Army tradition? You yeah, call absolutely. them exactly the opposite of what they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he was a very mild mannered chap, really nice guy, and a good friend of mine. And I said to him, "I've I've got a horrible feeling. I've left my my SMG behind." And he went, "What? Where? In that?" I said, yeah, in that field location. So he said, okay, well, let's just, we're on exercise. So I think you'll pretty much land anywhere. So we landed and had a good look in the, the, the aircraft. The gazelle's got a boot, like a, like a luggage compartment. Mm. We had a hunt in the, in the boot where the rest of our kit was no SMG. So I'm, I'm panicking at this point because, you know, that's not good. So we flew back to this, um, to this location and these German, um, I think they were M48. American tanks under, you know, West German camouflage had been through this position. You know, they'd been right through the middle, over the top mm. of the trenches. And I, we walked back up the hill. They'd long gone. They could see all the tracks heading off. And I, I know all, all the sorts of retribution I was going to receive were running through my head. And we had a walk around the location. And there, hanging on the branch where I'd hung it, was my SMG on its sling. Oh, I've never wow. been so relieved. 
So I put it in the aircraft, and um, and he said, uh, "We'll um, we'll agree never to mention this again, shall we?" And good as his word, <laughs> as good as his word, it ne- it was never ever mentioned that had left his SMG behind. Until today. Until today. Well, no, I've told the story since I left, obviously, because I'm, oh, okay. beyond, I'm beyond punishment, I hope. Um, I guess the more sobering point was that it was my first, you know, we had, when I was in the Sappers, we had people injured on exercise, you know, inevitably, particularly whenever, whenever doing bridging in the dark, there's lots of metal flying around and, you know, fingers get pinched or, or worse or severed. And you have road traffic accidents. We were very fortunate in, in both 12 Squadron and in 2-5 Engineer Regiment that I don't recall uh, ever actually losing anyone. Um, and so, you know, you take part in those big exercises. You hear about other deaths. You know, you hear about the three tank soldiers that took took shelter underneath the chieftain and it sank. And, you know, that, all those sort of urban legends develop about, you know, is there is there a, is there a limit on fatalities before they call the exercise off? And, I, you know, we used to hear this 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 a lot, but I think it was a bit of I think it was a myth. But there was certainly, you know, certainly data kept on 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 serious injuries and and um, and deaths because I've I've seen some evidence that it was discussed in in uh, in the House of Commons, particularly around the time of those really big exercises. Um, but I, you know, I never had personal knowledge of it, and it was only really when I was in the Army Air Corps in Germany, which when you think, okay, there were three regiments and three regiments, one independent squadron and two flights, one in Berlin and one in RAF Bruggen uh, of just, I think, six gazelle in each. So there are not that many Army Air Corps aircrew in the Army, let alone in Germany. Uh, and so when you when you lost someone that you knew, or even if you didn't know them, because they're in the same business as you were, uh, and you saw pictures of the wreckage, and a gazelle, the gazelle does not deal well with hitting anything solid. You know, they're, they're not, they're built for speed, that's that's really what they're built for, and and you know that that's that's quite alarming because then you it suddenly become it comes home to you even as a young invincible soldier um, that this is a dangerous pursuit, you know this is an extreme sport flying low level very fast underneath power cables hovering behind trees uh, is not really something that normal helicopter people would would do they'd avoid that at all costs it's, in, in fact it's called the avoid curve because you're using a lot of engine power in the hover something goes wrong you're going downwards and i remember we had a particularly bad summer can't remember what year it is may have been 86 where there were three or four significant fatal accidents um, one in, one included a, a Lynx uh, gunner who was a, who was a sapper corporal who I knew quite well, um, and they had they had a problem with the tail rotor um, and, and crashed into a village and unfortunately were full of fuel. Um, so there were two fatalities, and then I remember being woken up early one morning by the phone at home and asked to come into the squadron immediately. Uh, and essentially, an aircraft from one of the regiments, a Gazelle, had gone missing on night flying. Um, and the, so at first light, all of the available Army Air Corps aircraft, Lynx and Gazelle, were planning to fly the route in a, like an extended line, if you like. The airborne equivalent of beating your way through the woods with a stick. Um, uh, and unfortunately, the aircraft was, was it, it actually was spotted by a German search and rescue, uh, um, military search and rescue aircraft that was assisting in the, in the search. And it had flown up the wrong valley at night and instead of it basically flown into these very tall German trees and all that they spotted was this slight scarring of the treetops and it had lost velocity and then the aircraft had fallen into the woods and sadly the pilot was killed uh, but more chillingly as an air crewman who you know spent your time in that seat the poor old air the poor old air crewman had spent a cold wet night strapped into the re- into the wreckage waiting for the rescue party to arrive and he and he did survive um uh, but that was really sobering you know that was quite a sobering moment and it sort of made you it made you realize that you know this was this was this was this was the real business we were involved with and you know quite apart from you know our discussions about whether we thought the russians were coming or not you know this was this never nevertheless this was a dangerous pursuit that we were in, involved in i think what you mentioned about the exercises and the casualties well, not just during exercises, but during general operations, is 
again, a, a, a forgotten part of the Cold War because on both sides there must have been significant numbers of people who did not go home. Yeah, sure. I mean, particularly to the scale of um, to the sale of Crusader 80. And, and, you know, when I was with the Army Air Corps uh, Exercise Lionheart, you know, and I, I remember the, 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 um, the sort of element we were involved in was relatively small. But, you know, you did hear about these you know these accidents on exercise and you're right there were there were road traffic accidents which i guess were were inevitable you know particularly in germany you know they're very good driving but when there is an accident uh, it tends to be quite big especially on the autobahn mm-hmm. um so and you know we, we we didn't focus on it it was it was not something i certainly not something that worried me i was very conscious of it but I was also conscious that it was a bit of a, you know, we were playing for real here. You know, on that, on that on Crusader 80, there was a lot of military equipment moving around in the dark, radio silence. You know, it, it was inevitable that there were going to be, you know, the more tired people get operating that sort of equipment. Um, there's an inevitability about it. And in many ways, I think it was, it speaks testament to our training. Um, and I think it speaks testament to this, to the level of leadership that I certainly experienced was a very high level of dedicated leadership that was absolutely focused on keeping the boys uh, as safe as possible from home. Um, one of one of the core commanders was uh, a very cool character. So you know he'd been around the block. He was he was a fearsome character, um, and he, you know a very very good core commander. Um, f- but his reputation preceded him. He was actually very very kind to us in his own way. Uh, and he would often bring food with him to share with the crew. And one of our regular trips was to fly to Bielefeld, either to Catterick Barracks um, or the, the Nafia Bielefeld had a helicopter landing zone behind it uh, to pick him up. Or if it was an early start, which it was on this particular day, he used to go to Spearpoint House, which was down the ridge line from Bielefeld, which was the Corps commander's house. So, you know, it's a big house because he was the big cheese, basically. Um and and we picked him up, and I, I mean, very unusually, he didn't have his military assistant, who was a major, or his ADC, who was a captain. He was on his own, and we flew him to from Bielefeld to uh, Rheindahlen, to Joint Headquarters. So he probably had a, a, a meeting with the CNC or something similar. And then the, 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 the traditional route would be to skirt around the north of the Ruhr Valley, because it was, you know, very built up. And single-engine aircraft, not generally a good idea um, if you can avoid it to fly over the built-up area. So we'd fly around the sort of northern countryside of the of the Ruhr and then turn south. Uh, and we'd cross over Joint Headquarters and land um, just between Joint Headquarters and RAF uh, Vegberg, which was the military hospital. Um, uh, there was a, bit, a landing strip there, which again, I think was a glider strip we used to use. And there'd be a car waiting to pick the general up. And then we used to hop from there into RAF Bruggen to, I think it was Seven Flight, which are these six gazelles that were, that were essentially the liaison for JHQ. So they're doing a similar job to us, but in the rear combat zone. Um, and they had gazelle. We had gazelle, you know, Army Air Corps. So we'd basically crash in their, in their crew room, eat all their biscuits, drink tea, get the aircraft fueled up. And then we'd either arrange, we'd either agree a time with the general to go back and pick him up at Vegberg. Or occasionally he'd say, "I don't know how long I'm going to be. I'll I'll call you uh, when I'm when I'm ready to leave." And by the t- if he left in the car from JHQ at the same time as we left in the helicopter, we'd arrive at Beg- Vegberg together. Because the one thing he hated, amongst many other things, <laughs> scruffy soldiers he hated, particularly if they were infantiers. Um, he, always, he hated wasting time, so he wanted to get out of the car, get into the helicopter, and go. So we had to be quite sharp on our toes. Um, and I was with a very experienced Army Air Corps Star Sergeant pilot, um, very smooth flyer, really, you know, really good guy. Uh, and it was quite late. It was getting late in the, it was sort of, it was in the winter time. So it was probably October, November. Um, so we got to sort of three o'clock and I remember the pilot saying to me, well, I hope he calls soon. Otherwise we're going to have to get, we're going to have to get clearance to fly day into night, which the, you know, we clear night flying was a really planned exercise. It wasn't to be done lightly. Um, in a gazelle or in any aircraft but particularly in a gazelle so shortly after that we got the call um you know the generals the generals leaving now so we revved up went to vegberg arrived perfectly he climbed in the back um 
put his headset on, said, OK, uh, nice and smooth. Um, go back as quick as you like. Um, and then he got the Daily Telegraph out the, in the, you know, the, the broadsheet version of the Daily Telegraph and put his Prince Nez glasses on and happily reads the paper. So we used to fly directly north and then around the Dulman um, age, Halton, Halton Ranges, Dulman area, <clears throat> we'd turn east to avoid the, the Ruhr, as I described earlier on. And as we were making the turn, the, there was some banging and crashing from the back end of the engine, which is always slightly alarming. Well, it is for me anyway. And the pilot and I exchanged a glance, at which point, I think, technically speaking, the clutch exploded. So there's a clutch in that aircraft, like a roller, ramps and roller clutch. And it let go uh, quite dramatically, I have to say. So we started heading, uh, it, we entered auto rotation and headed downwards very quickly. I know we were going very quickly because the dust floated off the floor. So it was like negative G. So we were quite busy in the front. I could smell smoke, which is, again, something you don't really want. Not in, a hair, not in an aircraft made out of laminated baker foil. And so I was doing all of the crew stuff, you know, making sure harnesses are locked tight, make sure they've got the, the right frequencies on the on the radio. Pilot was making a call to clutch radar, which is the three air bases I spoke about, plus Guylen Kirken, which was a US-operated base, had a radar service called Clutch, because they were called the Clutch Airfields. And we'd always be on listening watch with Clutch. So he was sending a message on, a Mayday message to Clutch to say that we were making an emergency landing. And I was selecting Aviation Common. So there was an Army Air Corps common frequency for the other radio, for the UHF, I think it was radio. Uh, and I turned to the back and I said, um, can you check your harnesses tight, sir? We're going to have to make an emergency landing. And the general was unconcernedly folding his glasses up and putting them in his glasses case. And he basically said, all OK in the back, Corporal D. And he never, he would always call Sergeant Smith or Staff Sergeant X. The fact he shortened my name was probably the only clue I got. Because the next time I looked in the back, you know, sometimes you used to struggle to fold one of those broadsheet newspapers if it got slightly skew with. We were hurtling, yeah. hurtling groundwards with smoke coming out of the back and a lot of concentration in the front. The general was concentrating on folding the Daily Telegraph. And I sort of realized then, it's quite a cool character. So we we basically approached this very large German field with a couple of pylons in it um, and a big herd of cows. And I can remember making this, the pilot making this beautiful run on landing and cows galloping away in front of us. Uh, we had the landing light on because it was getting sort of starting to get a bit dusky underneath the power lines we slid and eventually came to a stop i leapt out with the fire extinguisher didn't need it by then whatever happened had already happened but there was a there was one of the engine decks covers was in tatters so something significant had happened and the the general got out put his overcoat on and the pilot and i walked away from the from the aircraft we we left it on electrically so its lights were still flashing and uh the general says well done, staff. That was very smooth landing. <laughs> uh, the, the, the pilot was quite cool as a cucumber about it, really. And then the sudden realisation that a staff sergeant and a full corporal are stuck in a field with, I, I can't remember what sort of general he was, but lieutenant general, I presume, uh, at that point. Um, and, you know, what are we going to do with him? You know, the one thing about a helicopter, it's at its most useless when it's on the ground. It's not even a particularly good shelter. They get cold very, very quickly. We were in the, I say the middle of nowhere, a large field. So we had a, a big walk in prospect and uh, the radios were still going. And I, uh, the pilot walked back to the aircraft and he was got his bone dome back on and he was talking to someone uh, on on the uh, on the net. Uh, and it transpired that there was an army air called Lynx from one of the other regiments, four regiment probably, it was on its way back to Detmold. Or to, or to Hill Design Detmold, I think. And had heard the Mayday, both on clutch radar and Mayday that we subsequently sent on Aviation Common. Um, and were two minutes behind us, same trip as us, coming up from Vegberg to go back to the, back into the uh, core area. And, uh, you know, there was some, there was what they call, in those days, called veiled speech, because we did have codes, but they were, you know, they, they were unwieldy, and we certainly wouldn't have had them in, in this sort of operation, but it's not something you want to be saying in the clear. Um, so mm. I think the pilot says something along the lines, they, they said, you know, can we be of any assistance to you? Are you, is everything okay? Can we be any assistance? 
uh, and the pilot said, um, we have quite an important passenger with us. Would you mind swinging by and picking him up? <laughs> so next <laughs> two minutes later, this lovely lynx comes uh, in behind us, uh, lands quite lands next to us. There's a few handshakes from the general who, with his with his glasses case and his Daily Telegraph, hops into the back of the of the lynx and flies away, um, which was 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 a relief for about ten minutes until we decided that one of us had to walk out to a telephone. And they they'd, they'd agreed to phone base. We thought we we we'd better yeah. do the right thing here. So I was sent to the village, which fortunately had a fish and chip shop where I was able to mutter the immortal phrase, in Schuligansi, my, my Hubschrauber is kaput. So in, in German, <laughs> excuse me, but my helicopter's broken, um, which was made slightly more believable. I felt I was wearing a flying suit and a, and a, and a bone dome. Well, I didn't have a bone dome with me, but, you know, I was wearing a flying suit with, yeah, with, yeah. with a brevet. Yeah, you looked the part. I looked the part. It looked believable. Yes, you know, it did, you know. <laughs> um, so I then I was able to phone back to Minden. And to be fair, they'd heard already, you know, the message had been passed that, that we'd had a problem. The message had also been passed by the links that we were OK, we were on the ground. And then uh, then started the long wait while we waited for the ground team to come down and attempt to recover the aircraft. But, yeah, I will never forget, as we screamed earthwards, um, seeing the general trying to fold the Daily Telegraph. Can you just explain how auto-rotate works? So if the engine fails in a helicopter? It, it depends on the aircraft, but the basic principle is that the the uh, the, the rotor blades disconnect from the transmission and actually speed up. So I think uh, if I'm right in thinking, I'm sure somebody listening to the podcast will write in and correct me if I'm wrong, but the tip of the blades at, um, at full speed on the Gazelle, and the Gazelle's only got two speeds. Some aircraft have got a throttle um, that varies the speed, but in the Gazelle, you had ground idle, which is the engine running, but the blades not turning. Uh, I can't remember what speed what speed the engine was turning at, but so, so the the little jet engine, the Asda Zoo engine, is running on the back of the on the on the top of the aircraft. It's on top of the cabin, um, and then the pilot would release the rotor brake, which is essentially, as the name suggests, a, a clutch. Uh, a, sorry, a disc brake with a caliper on it. Release the rotor brake and then advance the throttle, so the engine would speed up. And then there was a thing called a ramp and a roller clutch. So as centrifugal force. Um, speeds the clutch up the rollers roll out until they connect essentially the the engine to the to the rotors and then the the throttle is continued to be advanced forward and i think it's about 43000 plus or minus 43700 plus or minus something is the is the tips of the blades if you have a problem uh, and the engine fails um you enter auto rotation where the the blades actually speed up um and then you um it's like a like the, the sycamore leaf principle is you you flutter you I say flutter gently earthwards it's not particularly gentle um, and essentially pilots are taught on their course and as as crewmen spend time in the squadron uh, it's obviously to the pilot's best interest that the crewman can take control and fly the aircraft as well as they possibly can because you never know when you might be needing them you know if it, whether it's a piece of Russian 762 or you're just not feeling very well, it's good to have the person in the left seat that can fly the aircraft as well as possible. So, you know, all of us were eventually taught how to hover and, and, and you know, uh, all, all pilots were very keen that, that crewmen would um, would be able to fly the aircraft. And most of them were budding helicopter instructors as well, because that's a natural career progression. So we got a lot of stick time, I must admit. We got a lot of stick time. Um so that, but I do remember the the principle is is that you you scream earthwards at auto rotation, and then the pilot waits until he can seize the individual blades of grass, and then essentially pulls loads of power on the collective, which turns all three blades um, to essentially arrest the downwards fall of the aircraft, sufficient just to gently run it onto its skids. Now that's a bit of an art. They practice it a lot. They practice it a lot. So, the, and the senior helicopter flight instructor in each squadron will have a few practice runs, and then he will actually retard the throttle. So they're fully committed. You know, they, you, you you could restart, you could put the throttle back. It's not going to work because you, you're too near the ground. So they are committed. They do them for real all the time. Um, I've done I've done one as well with us with the SFI, but it's quite alarming as you head rapidly earthwards because it takes quite a lot of nerve, practice nerve to wait to the last possible minute. The risk of not doing that is that you fall out the bottom of your check, if you like, and hit the ground rather hard. 
So that's why they need to leave it to the last per- the yeah. perfect moment in order to get it to run onto its skids. So the the auto rotate essentially is generating some form of lift, and then by changing the angle of the of the blades just at the right moment, that just generates enough lift to just slow your descent. Correct. So that you smoothly correct hit the ground. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that that's that's the principle, and that the yeah. basically, I mean, I probably explained it really badly, and an aeronautics engineer or a member or a member of the Army Air Corps proper will no doubt come back and correct me. But that that's the basic. That's from a, the basic from principle. a layperson's point of view, I, I I I got how it how it worked. I was just intrigued because I've heard of this before, mm. but I hadn't realised that at the last minute you're changing the the angle of the rotor blade in order to generate that extra lift. Yeah, it's called the check. Yeah, it's called the check. I, 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 th- I thought yeah. one other thing as well is that I, I used to think we used to fly low. There was a period where we were not allowed to fly above 250 feet. So certainly on exercise Lionheart, the Americans took over essentially what's air traffic control. So the American aviation branch took, o- took over our area and overlaid another grid pattern on it. And they basically had to give clearance for you to fly in in an area and you were certainly not allowed to fly above 250 feet um, above ground level and that's because there was such a lot of fast jet, act, jet activity in the band above that um, and one of the jobs main jobs as crewman and pilot is to keep a good lookout so there'd be regular calls of you know fast jet fast jet left to right 10 miles we always enjoyed quite good visibility in the summer in germany um, and there'll be lots of aircraft moving around uh, and I was with a I was with the same pilot from the general incident actually, and we were flying along. I would say we we're about 180, 200 feet AGL, which is quite close to the ground. And we, well, I think there were some power lines, and we climbed above these power lines. So that's how that's how low we were. The pylons were higher than we were. Um, and in this particular area, it, he didn't deem it safe to go underneath the power lines, probably because of the, the terrain. So we climbed over this power line, and while we were still up at 250 feet, I looked down, and two F-111s were flying nap of the earth below us. Wow! You know the two, the, the F-111 Aardvark camouf- camouflage. Yeah, very, it's very, not a small plane. Not a small plane. Very, very <laughs> nearly didn't see them. Very nearly didn't see them, and they would have ruined our whole day. Just the jet, just the jet wash alone, let alone hit us. But just their jet wash would have ruined our whole day, um, and. We were speculating afterwards. They must have been at, at 150 feet, which for an aircraft oh, wow. of that size, how on earth how on earth they were given clearance to fly that low, um, in, you know, in a, in, a, in a populated area. Um, but yes, it was it was a real second. So glance. by chance, you climbing yeah. to go over the pylon avoided. Uh... Yeah, I mean, you know, they were a bit ahead of us, but you know, anything yeah. like that is still classed as a bit of a close shave. And so, you know, we reported yeah. it, and there were lots of. Couldn't happen. It couldn't happen. Didn't happen. But we, the two of us, saw these two aircraft, and they were closely formated as well. Incredible, incredible. So, where are we now in your Army Air Corps career? I was getting towards the end of my, as it turned out, four-year flying tour. Usually, it would be three, but uh, I had slightly longer for some reason. And generally, the point was at that point, you would apply, if you wanted to stay with the Army Air Corps uh, as a crewman, you generally would apply what they call pilot grading. So you would then go, you'd go back and verify whether they still felt you had the aptitude to be a pilot. Um, and if they did, you would then ask um, to be considered for a pilot's course. And then traditionally, if you were successful, then you might well transfer from your 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 host corps into the Army Air Corps at that point. I mean, it was very deliberate. The Army Air Corps sort of try before you buy. So let's not take all these soldiers onto the admin strength of the Army Air Corps if they're only going to do one flying tour. Um, and it comes from the way that the Corps was formed. And it's quite an efficient way of doing business. And, and you know, it puts experience out to the rest of the Army. So I was my, my attention was starting to turn to um, to do this. Other other colleagues who were air crewmen were taking that option and going away and doing their pilot's course. And it suddenly sort of dawned on me that, this was great. I thoroughly enjoyed it, but it probably wasn't what I wanted to do for the rest of my career. Um, I also had a couple of quite close shaves, an engine failure in the hover, which um, 
which had a firm landing, shall we say, concentrated the mind. And the pilot dragged me to another aircraft and we went off and completed the sortie. But that was on my mind. So um, I made inquiries with the core of Royal Engineers, whether or not they would welcome me back. Um, luckily for me, I flew some very senior sappers. So the, 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 the commander Royal Engineers um, in Germany was a regular um, passenger very nice brigadier, very personable chap. And he would talk to me because I was the only sapper he saw, really, um, you know, that wasn't in a sapper unit. Um, and I discovered, having looked at my personal file after the after I left the army, that he was quite influential in persuading the corps, who might have been a little bit reluctant to have Sergeant Davis by this time um, back. I mean, they looked after me very well. They promoted me twice while I was with the Army Air Corps. Um, so eventually the decision was made that, I'd been a what's called a potential clerk of works when I was in Chepstow, which is a, a senior um, a senior technical role in three disciplines, mechanical, electrical and construction. And I was a potential mechanical clerk of works. And it was agreed that I would come back to the core uh, and join the clerk of works mechanical course, which is a two year long course at Chatham, um, which has a a number of civilian qualifications attached to it. In those days, it was a higher national certificate in building services engineering. I think part of the problem is that, you know, after four years away, the Corps had changed quite a lot. They certainly didn't need me back as a petroleum fitter. Um, so I think it was the most convenient place to park me. <laughs> um, so, and that, that's that's basically how my Army Air, Corps, Army Air Corps service came to an end. Very, you know, with, 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 a, with a heavy heart and I got good reports but it was time to go, I think, and I, I so I came back to the came back to the core, did my Clarker Works um, mechanical course, uh, and then in in 1991, the completion of that course, I was lucky enough to be posted back to Germany, to uh, to Iserlohn, which is south of uh, south and south and east of Dortmund. Um, and I was posted to uh, two field support squadron in two six engineer regiment. Um, and uh, I was in charge of an engineer workshops, basically, as a, that was my job as a clerk of works mechanical. I got my I, I got involved in all sorts of other stuff as well, because I quite like marching. So um, they let me be the 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 the, uh, the Carter staff sergeant, which was uh, a bit of a coup for a clerk of works, because um, that was not really the sort of thing that you did. Um, so I, I had a very, very good tour there, um, went to back to Batus to do an exercise called Exercise War Paint, which is early in the year to prepare the ranges for um, for the for the Medman season, if you like. So create digging lots of trenches and sandbags and stuff like that. So I was in charge of that project along with a young officer um, and, you know, I had a really, really great tour in Ease Alone. Um, but options for change was was going on at that time, which was essentially the maximising on the peace dividend. The wall having come down in eighty nine, um, you know, German reunification happened in ninety one, didn't it? I think. Um, and so, just as luck would have it, it was announced that um, our area, which was Easelon and Hamer, um, so in fact, my married quarter was in Hamer, but also in Hamer was an infantry regiment and a tank regiment, which basically shared a very large piece of real estate with barracks on it uh, and I think there was a fence down the middle of the camp but anyway they so they were a tank regiment and an infantry regiment and they were the first to be moved back to the UK under options for change it's closely followed by 26 engineer regiment but the first departures were uh, were those two regiments and as I was a clerk of works there was a lot of this going on around Germany um, I was essentially seconded to what's called military engineering services which is sappers and civilians that look after the, the, the look after the military estate um, used to work for the property services agency but that, that changed over time um, and my job was to get involved in the drawdown of these two barracks um, largely when the military had left and taking preparing um, with civilian labor to hand it over to the German federal authorities and I got involved that was probably my last year um, was pretty much dedicated to that sort of work, which also including putting lots of commemorative plaques up in lots of stat houses around that three division area. Three division closed first. And it was very apparent how much the local German population, both in terms of the people, our neighbours, um, but also the, the, the federal, you know, the, the local or the stat authorities. So a lot of, a lot of units were 
essentially given the, the German equivalent of the freedom of the of the city, sort of the Fahrenbund, which is a, a pennant that would be attached to, to your, your colours if you have such a thing. Um, and so I was involved a lot with my tradesmen, my Royal Engineers tradesmen and, and civilians in that sort of work. And married quarters as well, huge number of married quarters got handed back um, to, the, to the German authorities. Um, and yeah, with very mixed feelings, actually, it was it was quite an interesting and sobering time. Um, but I was released from it from my sunshine tour. So I, I said to the, the CO, asked me, where would I like to go after 26 Engineer Regiment? And I think I said uh, Hong Kong, Cyprus and Shape in Belgium for some reason. Uh, and he came back from Manning and Records. He said, I've got some good news and some bad news. I said, well, I'll have the good news first. And so he said, I've got you your sunshine tour. You're going to Gibraltar. And I said to him, I didn't think there were any Royal Engineers left in Gibraltar, sir. And he said, no, when you get there, there'll be six. And I said, so what's the bad news there? He said, you need to be there next Thursday. Um, so that was my end. That was the end of my um, of my tour in, in Easelone. So uh, so I had a happy, a happy three years in, in Gibraltar. And then I managed to come back to Germany. And I did two further tours in Germany, one in military engineering services, looking after barracks and married quarters working between the German construction agency and the, and, the, and the military. And then my final tour as a W1 was in the Inspectorate of Engineer Resources in Hamel. Um, and basically the job was with a load of mainly, mainly ex-military, but civilian inspectors to inspect engineer equipment. So boats, amphibians, the bridging rigs, um, bridging um, and, and effect well instruct repairs we only did the inspection so so i'm it, all in all i think i managed sort of six, 15 16 years of, of my military of my 24 years military service in germany uh, and that suited me absolutely down to the ground and i i thoroughly enjoyed it but very interesting to see that transition from leaving in 1989 when the war was still up and coming back in 1991 and I remember driving to Magdeburg, and I think the, the group of Soviet forces, Germany, still had some, some residue. Um, and it was a very interesting experience to drive into somewhere we'd only ever seen on the map, or maybe through a set of binoculars. Um, so yeah, so that, that's me. We have further information such as videos and photos in the episode notes. Just look for the link in the podcast information. Now, this show wouldn't exist without our generous Patreons, so I want to thank one and all of them for their support. You can very easily become a Patreon by going to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. If you can't wait for the next episode, please visit our Facebook discussion group where listeners just like you continue the Cold War conversation. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Thank you very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye.